you, Paul. Uh, my name is Saurabh Narayan. I'm President and CEO of uh, National Community Investment Fund in Chicago. I stand in between you and a uh, nice glass of wine, uh, but hopefully this session is gonna uh, make it worth the while for waiting uh, uh, to hear from uh, this esteemed group of uh, private sector uh, investors in the CDFI sector. We've heard all day uh, uh, from the public sector and the amount of support that the CDFI industry is getting from uh, from the public sector and the government. Uh, here is a group of four institutions among many other private sector bankers who are actively supporting the sector by filling gaps from an operating uh, cost perspective, by supporting programs, and by more important, most importantly, supporting the long-term growth of the CFI cell. So we are, we are delighted to have um, uh, Tony Smith, who's senior vice president, and uh, Community Development Banking Executive for the Southeastern US Territory for PNC Bank. Uh, Tony, shake your, wave your hand. Uh, Nicole Williams, Executive Director from the Intermediaries Lending Group at JP Morgan Chase. Hello, welcome, Nicole. Garrett Murdoch, Vice President at US Bank Corp CDC. Garrett, hello, welcome. Uh, and Gus Perez, who is the lead social impact and sustainability uh, specialist for Wells Fargo Social Impact uh, and Sustainability Group. Uh, hey, Gus, how are you doing? Many of you knew Connie Smith, so I uh, guess is the new Connie Smith in that sense. Yeah. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, this session, uh, we have a chat box. So please feel free to ask questions and say how much more money you want to get from these four individual institutions and how uh, we will try to accommodate all those requests as possible. Uh, so uh, with that brief introduction, I want to sort of- These are the top results. Uh, start with asking the individual panelists to take a few minutes and talk about their work over the last two years. What have you learned? And what uh, you know, are you thinking about in the future? Let me start with Nicole, if that's uh, good with you, Nicole. Sure. Well, well, thank you, first of all, for having me and for having JP Morgan on the panel today. I'm looking forward to the discussion with my fellow panelists, uh, many of whom I've worked with over the past year um, and with, with all of you listening and watching today. So just a quick uh, addition to Saurabh's intro, which Saurabh, thank you um, for that introduction. But I've been at JP Morgan for about eight years, maybe a little more now. Um, and I sit in our Los Angeles office. Though I've been at the firm for eight years, I've been on the intermediaries lending team, which lives within the commercial bank of JP Morgan for about a year. I think I joined in late March, early April of 2021. So um, I, I'm going to adjust to Rob's question just a bit and look at the last year that I've been at JP Morgan and not the last two. So I'll tell you a couple things. One, you know, I've been working with high impact CDFIs across the country really for the past year. And what I love about the CDFI space is that impact looks different for each entity, right? So it could be that impact for this entity is its sheer size and its skill and sort of the depth of impact that it's able to have. Um, or maybe the breadth is the better way to say that. And then there's some CDFIs that I've worked with that are smaller that have a specific regional focus or a focus on a particular city that is important to our racial equity pledge, which we'll talk about a little bit later down the line of the panel today. But whatever that impact is, it's been phenomenal to see how CDFIs execute on that impact. And so that's been my work over the past year. And of course, my job as a banker is to provide traditional commercial banking products but in a way that really serves the CDFI and the work that they do. And sort of, you know, I always love that our, our CEO, Jamie Dimon, says, you know, that as a bank, we should be on the leading edge. And so we try to stay there with our clients. And so whether we're talking about blockchain or we're talking about new ways to um, take payment or make payments or take payments, et cetera, um, we, we love to sort of be on the edge um, of technology with our clients. So that's been my work over the past year. I would say what I've learned and what's been interesting to me from the start is that CDFIs are always seeking to strike this really interesting nexus of having impact 
and keeping a healthy balance sheet so that a traditional bank like JP Morgan or Wells um, can lend to you without a lot of questions around portfolio performance, right? And so that nexus is a really interesting um, point to, to, to strike. And I don't think that it's an answer you ever get to. I think it's a sort of summit of a mountain that we're all trying to reach. How do we have impact and make sure that we've got a wide enough credit box to have uh, robust lending activity uh, and do it in a way that really preserves the health of the balance sheet for your entities so that when a banker like me and my underwriter are looking at um, any credit request that comes to us, we have a lot of question marks around performance. How do we do that? And so again, it's not, I don't think that there's ever an answer to that question. It's constant discussion and thoughtfulness and creativity. And that's the work that I've really loved doing with CDFIs, with all of my clients really. So that's been one thing that I've learned um, and one thing that I, I think will continue to be an evolution. The second thing for me um, is that, you know, I started at JP Morgan eight years ago and I started in our business bank. And so I would work with clients that generated, you know, small businesses that generated sub a million dollars in revenue. And so these were smaller clients. And so I would always work alongside the underwriter trying to figure out how to get beyond the riskier elements of those smaller companies, right? And so whenever I had to deliver a decline, which was never, ever pleasant, what I always had in my back pocket was a CDFI that they could go to, that I could refer them to, that would take a hard look at their credit application. And so it's been sort of a full circle moment for me to be on this seat now, lending and working with CDFIs to really see the impact that you all have. So really an exciting time, and um, I'm looking forward to continuing to do this work. Thank you, Nicole. Uh... Garrett, do you want to take it from him? Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, if you want to, uh, you know, first a little bit of background um, for the CDC and really what our uh, CDFI focus um, has been. The CDC, our U.S. Bank Community Development Corp., we call us the CDC. Um, is primarily the tax credit investing arm of the organization. We sit in the subsidiary um, uh, of the organization doing the, the, the regular tax credit programs that we're all, we're all used to in the space. Um, additionally, they have a, a model for uh, syndicating tax credits into um, bringing new investors into the space. And then we have traditional kind of uh, community development lending um, out of the space, whether it's affordable housing or now CDFI. So if I go back five years, um, U.S. Bank had provided capital to CDFIs um, in kind of a traditional CRA, smaller dollars, patient capital investment portfolio that, um, um, that many banks do um, that are kind of regionally focused on CDFIs. And about 2017, U.S. Bank wanted to change its capital offerings to CDFIs and try to provide more scalable capital uh, to CDFIs outside of specific um, you know, CRA requirements. So um, what that resulted in us kind of building out a regular commercial bank unit that could be leveraged to CDFIs. And what we did was we built this, this business team that we call ourselves the specialty finance team around 2017, um, created our own bank policy that speaks to CDFIs. We think that's very important in, in being a, a, a bank financial institution driven by credit policies that our policies talk to CDFI vocabulary. And then we, you know, we have traditional commercial banking products that many of the other groups do as well, whether that's folding late lines of credit, fixed rate term loans, multi-bank facilities, and that existing portfolio of, of patient capital investments that have always been an, an important product. Um, and then to your question about the last two years, well, once you kind of have that establishment, um, you're able to really um, bring CDFIs, bring new product offerings once you kind of have that, that kind of baseline business unit established. And we've seen a lot of success in that. What that has resulted in, in some uh, private equity investment with uh, managed by CDFIs, new market tax credit lending opportunities from our bank, um, and capital markets executions, two of which we had last year, which was a racial equity bond uh, with enterprise um, community partners. And a tax exempt bond with Century Housing to facilitate the um, acquisition of an affordable housing property in Long Beach. So um, that is some specific um, evol evolution of our product offering set. And there's frankly more to come. I and mean, we're in the constant discussions internally about what other product offerings um, are, are really asked for in the CDFI space. And often I, you know, and we know there are other ones that we, we haven't addressed there and we're going to continue to work on that. Um, some of that is actually um, over the last two years, we 
uh, we, we have our, what we call our access commitment. This is the U.S. bank overall approach to addressing racial equity. Um, and then basically each unit within U.S. bank um, is charged with creating strategies to address um, this within their own line of business. And obviously there's a ton of overlap in what U.S. Bank CDC does in its everyday business, whether it's um, tax credit investing or, or community capital. Um, and what we did over the last two years, um, I'm just going to highlight a specific programs which are continued further evolutions from a traditional commercial bank product offering set. But through this access commitment with U.S. Bank, we prioritize Black-led and personal color led CDFIs. Um, in our kind of daily day-to-day -day product offering. That was become very important. That resulted in uh, $80 million of, um, of capital to invested in black CDFIs in last year. Um, we did the racial equity bond with the enterprise, which was, you know, um, uh, oftentimes um, banks can do CRA focused, geographic focused um, investment. This was an impact focused investment that we were very proud of. We did US Bank Access Fund, which is an actual program to support women of color owned uh, small businesses. This was a $25 million of patient capital um, and grants to the African American Alliance of, of CDFI CEOs, LISC and Grameen America. Um, and then uh, we also had a seat, some CDC specific grant programs. Obviously, we have a foundation that we partner with that does kind of things underneath their own um, outside pillars of, of work, home and play in our case. And the CDC came up and said, well, we actually see some grant opportunities. Um, we know that there's an ask. I think this group uh, often asks for that type of capital. And the CDC came up with different programs uh, to support that, one of them being um, looking to support developers um, of color. And uh, one way we did that was $250,000 to three organizations that had existing programs um, supporting uh, developers of color. Um, in addition to our, our new market tax credit, CDE, um, provided um, grants to um, black led CDFIs and the uh, African American Alliance of CDFI uh, CEOs. And lastly, we, we came up with some liquidity facilities over the last two years to support organizations making PPP. So I only point those out because the question of what over the last two years, building out this business from 2017 to now um, has allowed us to broaden our product offering from a traditional commercial bank sense and also um, um, being brought into these signature initiatives um, for our own client base. And that's been really successful. I just listed off five or six for you. We look, we meet again in two years on this. I hope that is, uh, you know, 10 or 12. So that's really what we've done over the last two years. Well, thank you, Garrett. Uh, based on what I'm hearing from you and from Nicole, there's lots of new opportunities, lots of new, new ideas that the CFS sector can tap into. Gus, uh, I'm going to request you to go next and talk about what Wells Fargo is thinking. Yes, thank you, Saurabh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm proud to represent Wells Fargo on today's panel. Um, Wells Fargo has been a long-term supporter of CDFIs and MDIs. Since 2011, Wells Fargo has actually provided more than $2.6 billion in funding to the sector. Historically, we have supported the sector through community lending and investments and philanthropy. Wells Fargo's Community Lending and Investments Group has been supporting the sector with debt and equity capital for over 25 years. The group has funded over 200 CDFIs of all sizes across the country in both urban and rural markets. Specifically, we've been providing patient capital to CDFIs, long-term, low, fixed rate, interest only capital. Also, we've been providing patient capital to nonprofit affordable housing developers for pre-development purposes. And I'll highlight some examples and share kind of some of the, the learnings that Sora have asked us to highlight today. So most recently, we've supported three state-sponsored COVID small business recovery funds with debt capital, the New York Fund, the California Fund, and the Colorado Fund. We'll continue to consider new efforts related to SSPCI funding and other sector or geography specific fund structures. We've also invested 50 million in 13 Black-owned MDIs, and our support doesn't stop there. We'll continue to work closely with them to bring tailored assistance from across our enterprise so that includes loan assets, branch strategies, technology, bank advisory and strategy services, financial health programming, networking, and access to Wells Fargo's ATM network. So one of the, the learnings from you know, over the past few years that we've been doing this work is that we really have to support the CDFI sector holistically. And we need to think through what are our tools to help support the CDFI sector. And so Wells Fargo has taken a real holistic approach to supporting each and every CDFI. We're looking at how we can pair debt with philanthropic dollars 
and how we can leverage our internal resources um, that the enterprise has to help build that infrastructure um, so that the CDFI can continue to grow and serve small business customers. Looking forward, as it relates to our community lending and investments, we'll continue to help CDFIs leverage the increased funding support coming into the industry by networking and sharing expertise with other funders and layering in debt capital to help those CDFIs scale. This includes also leveraging what I said, those Wealth Fargo Foundations uh, dollars to drive innovation. Um, and we'll really drive innovation in, in three focus areas, small business, housing affordability, and financial health, um, which are the three core philanthropic investment areas for our foundation. Through financial health, we work to open pathways to economic advancement by increasing financial inclusion and access, reducing debt, driving savings and wealth building behavior. Through housing affordability, we work to increase the supply of affordable homes, expand home ownership opportunities, and increase housing stability. And through small business growth, we work to create pathways for small businesses to build resiliency, grow, and thrive. Specifically, and as it relates to the work of the foundation, most recently we launched the Open for Business Fund to help small businesses survive the pandemic and navigate its impact. The fund has awarded over $420 million to CDFIs and nonprofits that serve small businesses so that they can access capital. Um, so that through technical assistance and through long-term recovery and resiliency strategies, those small businesses can thrive. The fund has a focus on diverse owned businesses and is estimated to serve more than 152,000 small businesses and preserve or create 250,000 jobs. And then of course, through housing affordability, we provided multi-year grant to Locus Impact Investment, a subsidiary of Virginia Community Capital to support their management of their community investment guarantee pool for affordable housing. This program titled CGIP helps de-risk affordable housing investments and attract and leverage bank and other institutional investments into projects. CGIP guarantees helps mitigate perceived risk, mobilize private capital and achieve affordable housing solutions. Um, and so I bring this up as well because one of the other things that, that we've learned throughout this pandemic is that, you know, uh, no one CDFI is made alike. And so we really need to tailor our solutions to the CDFI, where they are, and the needs of their community. And so Wells Fargo will continue to, to do that work, to view the, the holistic um, nature of the work and the needs of the communities as we continue to do um, that support. And so we will always complement our grant debt and investment capital um, to ensure that our CDFI and MDI partners can grow. Thank you, Gus. Uh, Jaylee Wells Fargo with the Open for Business program and the many other programs you talked about is really, really helpful. And I think the idea about looking at where the CDFIs are in their business cycle is an important idea um, uh, you know, as you look at support. So thank you. Uh, Tony, um, do you want to take it from here? Sure, happy. You know, uh, Sarah, um, our CEO, Bill Dimchak, reminds me, and in fact, he reminds all of community development that we have the best job in the bank and, and, and for a variety of reasons, including, you know, having the responsibility of making sure that the bank is a great corporate partner across our footprint. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so much of what we do, quite frankly, is, is because of how we're able to partner with CDFIs. You're, you're such an, an important part uh, of the fabric of our story. And when we look, you know, if I uh, start with your question on, you know, what's happened over the last couple of years, like everyone else, we, uh, we first had to deal with the pandemic. And for us, for us, that translated to more than $14 billion in PPP transactions. And, you know, folks like to say we had, you know, 14 years worth of work in 14 days, uh, but we did it as, as well as, you know, uh, uh, our peers. Um, and, and like others, we too had to come to the market with um, more than $80 million in uh, facilities that enabled our PPPs to get into those trenches and address those uh, communities that quite frankly, many banks uh, were missing uh, because it was critically important, obviously, to make sure that uh, many black and brown and underserved and rural communities uh, also enjoyed access. 
But from that, uh, some great things happened. We ended up building infrastructure and, and technologies that we think will enable us to do even more things as we move into the future. Uh, we also, uh, you know, to be very clear, we made an acquisition. Uh, uh, we acquired the U.S. assets of BBVA. And what came with that was a, an $88 billion commitment um, of which, you know, the, the typical uh, 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 compliance issues were, were identified. We're going to address home lending, small business, community development. But a subset of that was $400 million explicitly for CDFIs. And within that, uh, uh, another subset for uh, minority-led CDFIs and MDIs, because we know that they too need uh, a unique set of uh, uh, conditions through which we can enable uh, all of the terrific work that they're doing. But we also learned some other things. Um, there were some problems out there that have persisted for, quite frankly, for decades. One of them, for example, is the fact that some 80% of the equity capital of small businesses goes unmet every year. That's not your traditional lending and investing uh, kind of strategy. Uh, it's one that quite frankly, historically is funded by subsidies or philanthropy. But we decided to pilot two of these, one in Chicago, one in Milwaukee, where we're essentially providing equity capital to small businesses. And we're doing that through um, two partners. Uh, very delighted to share that uh, both are uh, women-led CDFIs. Uh, 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 Again, one in Chicago and a, a, a friend's Wibbick in, 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 in Milwaukee. Uh, again, terrific partners. But, you know, we got to think about, you know, where do we go from here? You know, we, we can talk about all the fun things and great things we think we've done. But ultimately, we're looking at the, the challenges ahead and how our, our CDF partners are going to navigate um, uh, certain emerging challenges in the community. I mean, while fundamentals for the US economy are sound. I mean, we're talking about 3.8% unemployment. We're talking about good, solid consumer confidence. Housing starts are up over 15.6% year over year. Home values are up, good or bad, uneven or not. We've created wealth. And CDFIs have been at the core of doing this. And that's why, you know, when I look back at what we did well over the last few years and what we have to do more of, one of the things that came top of mind was uh, we did over $465 million in scattered housing deals, understanding this is a long play, affordable rental housing today that becomes affordable home ownership in the future. We made a decision on our Opportunity Zone Fund that we would only do projects that were CRA eligible. And that, for the most part, translated into creating uh, a lot of attainable or workforce type housing and enabling uh, businesses that are uh, uh, building within LMI neighborhoods that absolutely needed reinvestment. And, and we're really proud of that and expect to do a lot more. And in fact, you know, absent you know, uh, a continuation of op zone type of legislation, we already decided that we're going to have an op zone like alternative that we're already deploying in markets so we can enable the continued revitalization. And then I'll close on, on this observation, Sarab, and that is that you know, sometimes we look at, um, at, at, at our work and, and we think about, oh, we created this great housing. But my friends at the Woodstock Institute remind me, he says, yeah. But are the people getting everything that they need? Are we really uh, attending to the services, access to transportation? Um, are we sensitive to the fact that, look, the, 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 the war uh, in, in Europe you know, is translating into higher energy costs for a segment of our population that is already energy cost burden on top of being housing cost burden. And all of this creates an opportunity for us again to do what I think we do best, and that is to partner with our CDFIs to find solutions. Let's fund those. Let's, uh, uh, let's, let's refine this definition of technical assistance to, to get at sustainable solutions uh, for the kinds of problems that our, uh, our partners are facing. And then I'll, I'll just close you know, on this last one. Yes, I know that hyperinflation, that um, uh, worker shortages, um, uh, uh, all of the, the, the challenges in sourcing inventories from overseas, all of these are having an absolutely horrifying effect on, on the cost of delivering affordable housing. And that's uh, going to be a challenge that we have to face when we think about you know, all the challenges out there. How do we create more affordable, not only rental, but for sale housing, if we're going to really put a dent in the wealth creation 
an equity equation for this country. And I'll pause there, you know, yeah. So, you know, you and I can talk for hours on this and I'm gonna pause and be polite to my co-panelists here. Well, thank you, Tony. This is very, very helpful. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, my next question was about strategic priorities for 2022 and beyond. And one of the things people really look forward to is, uh, you know, uh, should we focus on philanthropy? Should we focus on uh, long-term debt? Should we focus on equity, as you pointed out, Tony, or any off-balance sheet vehicle, you know, or all of the above? I mean, uh, uh, you know, is there any guidance that, you know, take a minute each, and is there any guidance, uh, you know, that you want to give to the sector as to how to access those different buckets of money? Because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot and it's great, but it's complex. Tony, you might as well just continue on because, you know. You just oh, sure. I, I, I'm happy to, to hop in here. Uh, what I'm hearing from my uh, uh, CDI, I'll call it my CDFI tour. I've, I've been touring all of the, the states in the, in the southeastern uh, U.S. first. And, and what I'm hearing here is this. We have a number of CDFIs who are, 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 are and, and our MDIs too. How do we grow prudently? in this economy where we have rising interest rates and many of them have uh, portfolios right now that have a substantial portion under fixed rates. You know, the classic funding with short-term monies, which have interest rate height vulnerability and funding long-term fixed assets, which are affordable to the constituencies that they want to serve. Uh, so how do we you know, preserve that those balance sheet fundamentals and how do we convince our investors that is prudent to invest in us as we grow. And, under, uh, and, and, and taking that uh, alone, uh, I see a number of emerging strategies for, for CDFIs. Uh, we got to think about what kind of runoff you're going to have in your portfolio and what that's going to do to all of the uh, uh, related ratios, your efficiency ratio, your sustainability uh, uh, dynamics, all of this matters. And how do you control the interest rate risk? And the, the answer is you, you, you've got to be able to fund um, uh, 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 those new assets in such a uh, uh, way that you preserve those margins. And that means as investors, uh, we have to adapt. And, and that's already translated into our providing not only the short-term, but more long-term affordable capital for our CDFIs. And you know the, the most typical instruments are your or your EQ2s, but there are others, and, and there's co-investing. And, and, you know, Sarab, as we, we talk about, you know, Credit Strategies Fund at, at NCIF, you created a really unique vehicle to uh, co-invest into or direct invest into MDIs and, and CDFI banks. Uh, I think we have to do more of that. Um, I, again, I'm going to pause there. I, again, I think there are a lot of other solutions out there um, but uh, chief among these, I think, is making sure that our CDFIs have solid uh, asset liability fundamentals that will be able to absorb the consequences of interest rate fluctuations. Well, that's a question that is in the chat box uh, from Calvin Holmes around interest rate risk. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I pose it to all the four panelists there, you know, is there any way in which uh, the CDFIs, you know, the bank investors can help support uh, this forthcoming interest rate risk, you know, as, as rates ratchet up and, uh, you know, can they absorb some of the cost? Can they, I know we talked about rate locks, but rate locks bring in this, you know, I spent 10 years of my life in derivatives. Uh, so rate locks have a cost in themselves. Is there some way in which we can support the CDFI sector as the interest rates rise? And, you know, anybody can take that question. Uh, uh, it's it's a real question that all of us are facing. I'm biting Sorry. my tongue for the moment. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Tony. I um, I will take this opening to talk a little bit about some of the different groups within J.P. Morgan that I think are helpful to this end, Sarab. I think. It, first of all, JP Morgan is an organization that's full of resources, um, and many of them touch the CDFI universe. The group that I'm in, Intermediaries Lending, is within the commercial bank. And so I always think of our group as having sort of a triple bottom line, right? You know, at some level, we have to be 
thoughtful about profitability because we live within the commercial bank. So there is that, that bottom line, right? But we're also, of course, CRA focused and then also focused on our $30 billion racial equity pledge, which Saurabh, I do want to come back to and make sure that I give some detail on that, but I want to stay focused on this question. So that's the intermediaries lending team within the commercial bank, right? So we've got a very specific focus and mandate. But then um, I've got great colleagues and uh, on a team called Impact Finance, and we work very closely with them. And it's a great partnership. Their job is to offer long-term flexible capital to community-based lending organizations that might fall outside of the credit profile that's appropriate for my team, right? So they're another resource to CDFIs. And depending on the deal, they're able to offer you know, longer tenors they're able to offer below market rates um, that are really helpful you know, at this point in the yield curve. And then also um, what I really love about this team is that they're able to offer flexible covenant packages. So these are all the things that you can think through and talk about when you're connected to this team. And of course, I'm happy to make these connections. I'm sure Sarab will share my email address along with uh, my fellow panelists here but also our corporate responsibility team. And they're phenomenal. And of course, when you think of corporate responsibility, you think of grant making. Their job is to invest in our communities across the country, but really along four pillars. So it's jobs and skills, neighborhood revitalization, small business expansion, and then financial health. And of course, CDFIs touch every one of those pillars, right? So um, CDFIs obviously are very appropriate grantees for our corporate responsibility team. So that's another team just to keep in focus. There are a couple more, but and I'll touch on them lightly because I want to come back to something. But our new markets tax credit team, they're phenomenal. Uh, obviously, Chase is um, a leader in this space. We're an active investor in this part of the industry. And of course, many CDFIs are also CDEs. And so they're active partners um, in this part of the industry with us. But also, there's another team um, that we work closely with. They live within our our business banking group. And so their job is to, if, if JP Morgan Chase cannot do a loan, a small business loan, they can refer to CDFIs. And so it creates this great connectivity between our team that lends to CDFIs, this team that refers to CDFIs, and then all those groups in between, whether it's impact finance, corporate responsibility, new market tax credit, et cetera. So my response to this question is that there are tons of resources at JP Morgan. I'm all I'm happy to be a conduit to those resources, but you know, I would say we're in a time of uncertainty and volatility and changes in the yield curve. And I think the best thing to do is to have really open conversations with your banking partners. I can tell you that there are transactions that I started working on in the summer. And when I look at those rates that we were proposing then and the rates that I have to propose now, they look very different, right? And so we understand that we wanna mitigate your cost of funds because that cost of funds flows through to your end borrower. So we wanna have really open conversations about what's necessary for you to respond and to lend responsibly um, so that we on the front end of that lending to you can be very helpful. So I think having those open conversations and really fluid conversations because the market is very fluid right now is key to having success for us and for you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, you know, I mean, what's one of the things that's coming out at me is that there are lots of different parts of money and that how do you navigate the system and, you know, appreciate your, your focus and your willingness to be you know, one of the navigators for CDFI. So uh, that would be really helpful. But I, I really want to stay on this interest rate risk question because that's a big question for all of us. Uh, and, uh, you know, Gus and, US, uh, and uh, Garrett, you may also want to chip in. Uh, it's one thing to hedge, it's another thing to absorb because if the long term cost of debt goes up, to 5%, 4%, then you know you can't lend that money out to people who need that money at cheaper costs. So I think we should uh, collectively think about uh, finding ways of subsidizing that perhaps through philanthropy, you know, such that uh, CDFIs can get some money uh, at a continued reasonable rates uh, for, for on, uh, on, on lending. Yeah. Uh, so just a thought, you know, Gus, uh, Garrett, did you want to add to the conversation here? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go for, I'll go first, Gus. I, um, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, those are great points, and I, you know, um, I, I'm not surprised that you know Calvin, you know, asked this question. I think Calvin does a great job of, of, of challenging everybody. And, and one thing I, uh, I will say is, you know, I think what you're asking for, and Nicole just kind of touched on it, is, 
Um, you asking the banking partners to provide a variety of different solutions that a lot of, a variety of different products, whether that's softer capital or, or commercial bank capital or other sorts of philanthropy, if you continue to ask the partners to do that, um, you know, you'll utilize them differently in different times of, 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 of adversity, right? So yeah, over the last four years, um, it was very attractive to go out and source all kinds of bank capital because the interest rate environment was declining, right? And so now everybody's seeing that, yeah, commercial bank capital is going to be much more challenged in this volatile interest rate environment. And I, and I echo Nicole's comments on how from a daily basis, the cost of funding for for uh, commercial bank products go up. So I think asking partners, and Calvin does this a lot with us, um, you know, asking for different types of part, uh, products to become available. And the more people do that, that's why we have seen expansion of products. Nicole has, I think, mentioned expansion, expansion of products and these other uh, partners as well. Um, and, you know, we were very excited that I mentioned in my opening that some of the grants that came specifically out of the CDC, um, you know, as we tried to figure out ways to solution over the last few years, it, it frankly, it comes from Calvin asking for that type of capital for for the previous four years. So, you know, and another part and other partners as well. So I think continuing to ask groups to, you know, expand your products that that I can uh, pull on different products um, during different times of adversity is a way to address, um, you know, the next few years of a rising interest rate environment. And and, you know, we'll you know hopefully continue to evolve in that. And I think you've heard uh, these, these various panelists talk about how they've involved. And so I think continuing to challenge us to do that will be one way to navigate that uncertain uh, environment. So sorry, Gus, I cut you off. In context. No, that's a great point, Garrett. And I'll, I'll be, you know, fully honest. I think, you know, through the Open for Business Fund, we, it was really important for us to lower the cost of capital for the entrepreneurs during the pandemic. And so, through most of the grants we made to over 144 CDFIs, we did actually reimburse the CDFI to lower that cost to 3% or below so that the borrower didn't need to pick up that cost. But I think from a philanthropy perspective, considering that there are over a thousand CDFIs in the United States and considering the amount of dollars that those CDFIs put out every single day to small businesses, it would be nearly impossible for philanthropy to step up and say, we can buy down the, the cost of capital or help cover that um, you know, uh, volatility that, that you might see on an ongoing basis within the economic market. So I think there is always the opportunity um, to, to really think thoughtfully and, and co-create with philanthropists and think about you know, we want to do a niche program in this community, and we think they would benefit most from X and Y, um, and really structure some interesting deals. But I think holistically for um, philanthropy to step up and cover those costs would be very, very difficult. And I don't know that, that we even have the capital to, to, to do that as a, as, a, as a field based on all that, that is happening. So I think kind of, uh, kind of echoing Garrett and Nicole, I think there are um, real innovative solutions that we can think about um, to to become more resilient against those those changes, um, but I don't know that that philanthropy is is that silver bullet. Um, me being like fully honest and, and transparent. No, no, I, and, and and that's true. I mean, I mean, it's it's really is a question of recognizing that partnership and finding out ways that, you know, there might be some fault lines, that, you know, there might be some stuff that, you know, uh, that needs to be covered and finding innovative ways, as you said, Gus, to, to, to fix those fault lines. Because, you know, we've seen a low declining interest rate environment for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, I don't think many people have seen those business cycles where rates have ratcheted up. Yeah? And if the rates ratchet up, because of all the reasons we know and some we don't know, um, you know, we might have issues. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as an industry, we would continue to request for support as we, you know, as we encounter uh, those issues. Tony, I know you were biting your tongue. and I, yeah. I am because first, first of all, I'm going to say this. I, you know, Calvin Holmes has put a number of chats in there. So I'm going to use Chicago Community Loan Fund as an example. Calvin and his team obviously saw the potential for an interest rate hike. You know, it was no secret. We all recognized we had been in a low interest rate environment for a long time. 
So what his team did is they came and they said, you know what, we have a pretty good idea what our investing and borrowing needs are going to be for the next few years. And so they did enter a forward rate lock type of scenario where they locked in low cost funding for the future. Very smart move on the part of Chicago Community Loan Fund, and we were there uh, to accommodate that. And, and uh, this is an indirect way of saying he wasn't the only one. You know, we had, we've had conversations with folks like Cindy Holler at Community Housing Capital in Georgia and other partners across the country where this is the role of the board of directors. This is the role of, of the, the executive leadership in the organization. Um, we have to be thoughtful about the risk environment within which we operate. And I can say that, Sarah, you know, you and I both came out as a shore bank family where, you know, we know, among other things, we had 85% of our assets concentrated in the poorest neighborhoods, you know, in our footprint and the hardest hit when an econ uh, economic downturn came. And so um, this is one of those periods where we really have to call on, on the leadership of our CDFIs to really think about what is growth going to look like? How are we going to fund it? How are we going to manage the interest rate risk in it? And at the same time, to your point, without creating an untenable burden for those end users, many of which are low to moderate income families or uh, organizations that serve them. And so, yeah, I do think there is a role for philanthropy. I think there's a role for local government. We have, but we have to look at it uh, by asset class. By way of example, you know, as when we look at uh, uh, affordable housing. Is this a time now where uh, a long championed uh, strategy to uh, uh, build more shared equity or other types of strategies really have to come of age so that we can make uh, the assets and the monies of our CDFIs work smarter and be more enduring. And, and I'm a big fan of creating, first of all, I have a very long-term view. So when I say scattered housing, 15 year rental, and then you become an owner 15 years down the road, it's going to be here before we know it. Uh, Sarah, I think we've known each other 20 plus years. So we know the time will fly and it's flying as fast as the hair off the back of my head. But you know, the, the bottom line is we, we got to think more broadly. Um, and it's why, you know, when we think about, you know, uh, uh, driving wealth in our low to moderate income neighborhoods, you know, so much of that is what people think when they drive to and through those neighborhoods and why community revitalization oftentimes is not evenly distributed over town, but rather in catalytic neighborhoods where you know you build this, this anchoring business or, or, uh, or destination at, at some core and you expand out, believing that let's save, we can't save all the neighborhoods at once, let's save as many as we can, but let's focus on where our CDFIs can be really strategic about driving change and driving wealth creation and uh, addressing so many of the other ills that are out there. All of that to say, um, um, we don't know all the answers yet. And my hope is when we walk away from here, we've inspired some CDFI partners to get your ideas out, send the email out, let us know what you're thinking. Because if we really are going to be the most racially equitable and socially just segment of the entire finance sector, which by the way, CDFIs already are, we can still do more. So I'm a pause. Thank you. So Thank Rob, you. I would love to add to that if you, if you don't mind. I know that we're getting close to time here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm, seeing if I can, I'm seeing if I can request for another five, 10 minutes uh, because I'm sure we could want to <laughs> hear from the, this group a lot more. We started late. Okay, well then I'm gonna just build on some points that my um, my, pan my fellow panelists have made here because I think they were all so great. First of all, Gus made a great point about banks getting creative and innovative about how do we use all of the resources that we've got um, inside of our firms. I just mentioned all of the different groups within our firm, corporate responsibility, impact finance, et cetera. And what's been interesting to me is to see on some of our transactions, we've worked together uh, with the other groups in our firm and it's been a great partnership. And I can tell you that a fund that we closed recently, you know, our team was the senior debt Impact Finance came in as sub debt, and then we had corporate responsibility come in and make a grant for the loan loss reserve. It was a great partnership. And then of course, other investors were able to contribute as well and grow that fund dramatically so that it can have real impact. But doing that work together internally, I think Gus is right, it's our work to do as banks to think that through. How do we use all of our resources as the climate changes? We're gonna to need to pull more of those levers. And so it's our work to, to continue to do that and be thoughtful and creative and innovative. So I fully agree 
with Gus on that. And then Tony made mention of um, a forward rate lock, which I haven't heard about a forward rate lock in so long because entities haven't had to do that in quite some time. Um, but uh, again, as CDFIs, you know, come to us with your ideas. Is it a forward rate lock? Is it, you know, we had a transaction that we intended to close as a fixed rate deal? you know, something that we talked about six months ago. And now when we look at the cost of funds, our cost of funds has changed dramatically. So the rate that we would have to extend to our client has changed dramatically. How do we get around that structurally? And so we thought about it for some time and the client made a request around, well, could I, could I determine at the time of draw on this facility if it could be a floating rate? or a fixed rate draw. Again, something that I had not heard a client request in a very long time and something that our finance team is thinking through accommodating. So again, my point is bring to us your ideas. Let's have those open fluid conversations because um, you'll find that uh, what I really love about this group and about the team that I'm on now is that we really work along this, alongside the client to structure these transactions to make sure that they work for you and they work for us, right? So, um, you know, I wanna make sure that we you know, open the floor for you all to have very um, candid conversations with us about what you need, and then let us pull the levers of resources within our firms to help you meet that need. Yeah, and one thing I'll add, Sora, I love that Tony talked about looking forward because I think that is so important. One of the things that I've seen over the past two years is that CDFIs have become so innovative and have been experimenting with products that I have not seen in the past 15 years in the field as a lender. So it is an amazing time to really build on, on those pilot programs for philanthropy to step up and say, you know what? Yes, I'm gonna take the risk and invest in you so that you can operationally put out new products and services that better meet the growing needs of the small businesses that you're supporting or whatever your customer may be as that CDFI. And so I do think that there's an opportunity to think about how do we hone in on the core work that needs to happen every day and how do we support the institution so that it can continue to do that core work, but we can't forget about creating opportunities for CDFIs to innovate we can't think about, we, we have to think about how do we co-create with you? How do we take that risk with you? Because I think that's the only way that the field is, is, is gonna move forward. And we have to be comfortable as a bank saying, we're gonna invest in that innovation and we may fail, but that is okay because we're gonna learn something along the way. Um, and, and hopefully we're there so that that failure, if it does happen, you know, doesn't impact the CDFI. Um, but if we do have a success, that there's some shared learning for the industry. So I do think there's also just a huge opportunity for us to just look back over the past two years and really just pull out so much of the innovation that has happened in the industry that I personally just have not seen, um, you know, over the past 15 years. Thank you. Uh, I know we're running out of time and there's one very big important subject that I don't know whether we'll have enough time to cover, which is racial equity and how you guys are supporting it, um, uh, supporting CDFIs that are focused on racial equity. Uh, if you want to, you know, I don't want to do subject uh, a disfavor uh, by just trying to do it in a minute or two. Uh, if there are ways in which you want to, uh, Tell CDFIs that here we are open for business, to use your phrase, Gus, uh, as to reduce uh, the ills of racial equity that we've seen for generations. So just take a minute each, no more than that. You know, I know it's I'm doing a disfavor on that. So, please. I will try it to do it in one minute. It is a really dynamic portfolio of work we're doing around this, but um, quickly, JP Morgan formalized its racial equity pledge in the fall of 2020. So we're just about a year and a half in, though the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion has long been a part of the DNA of the firm. But to quickly touch on some of the, the highlights of it, um, it's a $30 billion pledge, a five-year uh, commitment, and so we will do a few things. One, increase sustainable ownership. And what I love about that is sustainable. I think that what we wanna do is, um, you know, we're committing $8 billion to that part of the business, but 
what we want to do is to ensure that um, home ownership is not only achievable in our minority communities, but it's sustainable. So making sure that those loans work for, um, for the home buyer. So that's an incredible part of our work. So the second part of it is small business expansion. So we're putting $2 billion towards lending to Black and Latinx uh, minority entrepreneurs and making sure that we widen the credit box enough for them to be able to get some of that deal flow that we see in our business bank. So that, that's another $2 billion. A huge chunk of it lands right in our wheelhouse. Um, so $14 billion will go towards the creation of 100,000, creation and preservation, I should say, of 100,000 affordable housing units across the country. And someone mentioned that the cost of building um, these units is going up. And so we have to manage through that. But our $14 billion pledge stands for, for that five years. And then of that, about $300 million will go towards lending to CDFIs and increasing our capacity. We already we do about that much every year anyhow, but increasing our capacity to lend to CDFIs and to do it at rates that allow you to go on and do your great and impactful work in your communities. And then we've uh, put about 100 million, it started at 50, but it, it ramped to 100 million in MDIs across the country. I could go on because I think I've only touched on about 25 billion of the 30, but I know Sarab is going to make me move on. So well, I would say the last billion this. or so is focused on corporate responsibility and grant making. We could get much more details, but um, that pledge stands for five years. We're a year and a half into it. We're monitoring it. We make very public our tracking on it. So keep us honest, hold us accountable but it's a part of what we do and how we do our business. So it will continue long after the five years has passed on. Thank you, Nicole. One minute each to, you know, uh, to the rest. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, so, you know, for- I guess for, I'm getting a stick from the other side. So request for that, because this is such an important subject. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 keep going. Oh, wonderful. So, you know, we will continue, we have and will continue to have a focus on building a more inclusive, sustainable future and advancing racial equity is at the heart of that work we do, whether it's within housing affordability, small business growth and financial health. But what I'm excited about most is co-creating with CDFIs because I think we do have to mature how we do our philanthropic work. We have to evolve how we measure impact and we have to ask the hard questions, right? We have, it, it can't just be about how many businesses did we deploy dollars to. It can't be just about how many jobs did we create or preserve. We have to ask the question, are those good paying jobs? Are those jobs that pay health benefits? Um, we have to think about, are we creating wealth for the communities that we're supporting? So a business could receive that loan. A business could be generating more revenues, but is that business building assets? And is that individual business owner actually building wealth or has their income actually not changed over 20 years? So I think as an industry, I look forward to thinking about how we can mature our programs, our services and our impact measurement to really understand, are we driving the needle on wealth creation? Because I think we can focus and say, we're going to touch more diverse owned businesses or more diverse individuals, but are we moving the needle? I think has to be at the crux of everything we do. Thank you, sir. Um, and maybe I'll go uh, start up real quick. Um, I think I touched on the uh, USA. But yep, yep, US Bank access commitment in the beginning. And um, certainly that's our, our main uh, program focus. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to have product offerings off of that. I touched on, you know, seven or eight that we've already been, had in alignment the last few years. We're going to continue to do that. Um, it's very important to what US Bank does. I think uh, one of the other things that we, I kind of touched on that we, we do, we, we've, we focus our internal DEI strategy to try to build an inclusive culture built on anti-racism for ourselves. And we've taken that work external. One of those items that we've taken external is we have our anti-bias, anti-racism workshops that we have with for US Bank employees and other uh, clients and other community partners. And that's an example of us taking that work external um, in addition to the other product offerings and other solutions we're bringing in. And we're gonna continue to do that under kind of a, a larger global um, access commitment for the entire bank. But certainly you'll see the majority of that coming out of our uh, US Bank CDC. Thanks, Gary. Tony? Yeah, I, I would say this. First of all, um, community development is just a, a 
part of the bank. And I, I like Nicole's reference to the fact that you got to look across an entire organization. And that's what we're trying to do. And that means uh, when we think about how it will look, it means that we're doing more affordable community health care. It means that within our public finance division, we're enabling the kind of infrastructure that makes a uh, lower amount of uh, red, uh, uh, income neighborhoods more livable, drivable, uh, uh, closer to transit oriented development. And we really got to drive not only our business, but our policymakers to do the kind of things that are going to drive equitable outcomes and make them more doable and sustainable. It means that uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to look at, at how we address, again, housing across all of our platforms. And uh, I, for me, the biggest priority right now is boots on the ground. If we don't have people that look like us, and us, by the way, is Black, it's Latinx, it's Hmong, it's all of the underserved peoples of color out there, then we're not going to solve the equity equation. And so it's a, one of the reasons why we are, we've decided we're hiring differently, uh, we're screening, it's not necessarily a Rooney rule per se, but we are going to have people that look like us on the streets, driving business, cultivating relationships, and making it happen. Uh, it's been, you know, let's, we've been fighting this battle for decades. Um, we can fix it and we need to. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you to, uh, to Nicole, to Gus, to Garrett uh, for this really inspiring panel. We are really grateful for the support that the investors give us and have been flexible. So I uh, really, really appreciate that. I, I know I speak for, on behalf of the sector as a whole you know, to have uh, support from you guys and many other, you know, uh, private bank investors. I know I'm out of town, uh, out of time. Uh, thank you to Bob and to Bridget for accommodating the few extra minutes for the group. Yeah, so that.